All right, technology serves us well. So good afternoon, everyone. I hope you've had a lot of coffee. We are going to talk about the internet of things and the internet of people. Um, and that is not just the internet, it's the internet plus the rest of the world. And I'm pretty excited to be joined here by two wonderful panelists who bring a variety of different experience to this topic. And so let's begin with the obvious question. What the heck do we actually mean when we say the Internet of Things? Tell us. Well, different people mean different things, but what we've been focused on is that most things can now be sensors to bring data in, and most things can now be clients to take data out. Um, so that means that things can help us learn more. We're collecting data in the weather business, sure, from billions of observations. Now, it's been a tenfold increase in the last few years. And, and then taking that back to billions of locations. So it, uh, it helps make things smarter. You can use it to be more efficient because the information is being shared across users of energy, transportation, et cetera. Yeah, let me add to that. It's not just the proliferation of, of data and our capabilities to handle huge amount, huge amount of data. It's also this proliferation of data generating devices that will be hidden all over the place. We will have them in our clothing, we will have them in our smartphones, in our household appliances. Uh, they will be all around us. And I, I saw a recent estimate that by the year 2020, which is not very far from now, we will already have 50 billion smart and connected devices in the world. That will basically mean that the computer will disappear and will merge with the real world. And that whole merger between what's software and hardware and what's the real world and what's the virtual world, I mean, that is at the core of the Internet of Things, uh, but that will lead to a paradigm change in many of our daily applications. So we have a deep philosophical crisis coming, is what I hear you saying, this merging of the real world and the virtual world. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it a philosophical crisis since it will, in many regards, make our lives so much easier, so much more comfortable, and, and that's also important for societies as a whole, so much more efficient as when all these devices start communicating with each other and reacting to each other, that will enable us to achieve levels of efficiency and flexibility in all applications of daily life that are completely uh, uh, unseen. If you just look at, for instance, uh, I was just thinking yesterday when we had this extreme weather uh, here in New York and the torrential rainfalls. Yes, and thank you, David, for bringing back the sunshine. We all appreciate it. Steffi paid extra for that. Well done. Well done. But I mean, days like that obviously are a huge challenge for a city, its citizens, and, and its infrastructure. I mean, the, all, all, basically all patterns of daily life uh, uh, change. I mean, there will be less people walking. So, so let's talk about this. Um, what does the Internet of Things mean to us on an individual level? What does it mean to us on the level of cities and, and the urban experience? And what does it mean to us as a society? Like, can you please expand? Yeah, I mean, if we take a day like yesterday as an example, um, everything will change in, in, our, in our daily lives uh, with, the, with the weather we had yesterday. There will be, uh, obviously, less people walking and biking. There will be, on some routes, there will be more people taking the, the subway. Others uh, will have more cars on the streets. Everything will be, will be disrupted uh, by... Uh, by, by floodings, the water and sewage system will have to cope with huge amounts uh, of water. There will be increased um, energy demands as a lot of people turn their heater on again. Um which doesn't happen that, mo that often at that time of the year, while some sources of energy, such as renewable sources, uh, solar or so, would not be available on that day. So how does a city cope with that? In the future, we will have much more flexibility since we will have much more real-time data available of what exactly is happening in a city's infrastructure on days like that. We will know exactly how many people will be traveling on what underground lines. We will know what kind of traffic we have on what, on what streets. We will know exactly what kind of power will be consumed where and what for. And our systems and the direct connection of, of, of devices in the system will enable us to reflect much more flexible to that. And on top of all that, of all that real-time information we will have, we will also be able to much better forecast days like that because we will be able to use historic data. We will, uh, out of the analysis of these historic data, be able to forecast how people react to days like that. And we will be able to simulate situations like that virtually before they happen and by that means get much better prepared to them. Did you have a different question? No, go ahead. Well, I, I, I wanted to bring it down to a specific example um, because to me I think the, 
the challenge is going to be where do we trust the data and where do we have humans. So we provide data to thousands of industries. A good one would be aviation. Most people here flew. Most people know that um, all turbulence is caused by weather. 70% of all airline um, departure and arrival delays are caused by weather. We've cut turbulence in half in the last five years through sensors on the wings, because you didn't just need to know the weather on the ground, you need to know the weather in the atmosphere. Um, and so we could send better data, um, but then the commercial airlines and some private pilots have gotten much smarter about letting the data tell them where to fly to avoid turbulence and to build plans. This also allows them to go more often because they can, they can route their path around it. But this meant you had to trust the machine because if you, if you try to interpret it as a human, 70% um, of the time you actually made it worse, you made an error. So I, I think in that case, there's been a trust to machines. In other cases, um, this week I'm very sad. 35 people died this week in tornadoes. All of those people were given a minimum of five days notice. All of those people had sirens and alarms, but they just said it's a probability, not a certainty, so I'm not going to take cover. And so I think this ability to make decisions on the data, to, tr to, to allow the machines, uh, to trust the machines to make more of the decisions for us, I think is going to be a really key change. And if you, change, if you compare aviation to on the ground weather, you see night and day differences. So that's a really interesting thing you bring up, that people don't trust machines. Now, I'm a computer scientist. I'd much rather have the machine in charge, right? Like, yeah. uh, people make mistakes. Machines, at least, make logical mistakes. Um, so do you see this as being a big challenge for, for adoption of Internet of Things technology? Do you see it changing? Like, are we culturally going to hit a point at which we are comfortable trusting the machine? I think people are really struggling to, to trust something they don't understand. And, and there are so many solutions, whether it be in medicine, where it's pretty clear where to take precautions. Um, I think in response to weather, for sure. Um, I think in the stock markets. There's all sorts of places where people think they're, they're smarter than the machine. And I don't mean to say that you can do it all by machine, but too often people want to trust their own instincts, even when the machine will tell you something else. It's why we don't solve energy. It's part of the challenge to climate, because you can actually be much more efficient in the use of energy if you balance it. So, then so when let's people stick to the thing they want. That, um, how is data and data technology making us more resilient, uh, hel helping us use our resources in, in an optimal way? Can you talk about this? I mean, the topic of energy is very interesting as, well, I mean, there's so much technology out there which is still in its infancy, but it, which is actually mature to make our, our power grids and our electricity systems more, more, more efficient. And also not just more efficient, but also much more environmentally friendly in terms of you know, bringing CO2 emissions down and that's all based on smart technology it's all based on the availability of data and the availability to react more flexibly to, to certain situations but also these these uh, technologies will make our systems more resilient and New York City is a very good example for that uh, New York had a big warning call like two years ago with Hurricane Sandy and not just to New York but to the entire world this really brought this discussion around city resilience and the resilience of uh, cities transport and, and, and power uh, infrastructure on, on a really new level of the discussion because a city as wealthy and sophisticated as New York was not able to cope with what happened. And it was not just the floodings, it was half of Manhattan being out of power for, for five days. I was what, here. And, 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 and that actually uh, uh, is, is a challenge which will, with increased fre frequency, happen again. I mean, all forecasts show that extreme weather, weather events like that or others like heat waves or so will actually happen much more often in the future. What can be done about that? I mean, a lot of simple things can be done. Uh, building dams and, 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 and better planning of the city's infrastructure to not have critical elements of the infrastructure in um, potential flooding zones, but that will never fully protect the city. If a city wants to fully protect itself, it needs to make the infrastructure more uh, yeah, smarter and more intelligent. So based on the information you gather, you can react to disruptions. You can, for instance, reroute power from where it's not so necessarily needed to hospitals and other entities where it is needed. And we did a very interesting piece of research together with the Regional Piano Association here in, uh, in New York to look at what could New York do, what would all that cost, and would it also make sense to do it in economic terms. And we actually found out that if New York does nothing, 
it will lose, based on the current forecast for major weather events, it will lose up to $3 billion over the next 20 years. If it just physically protected its infrastructure uh, by, you know, better planning, undergrounding lines and so, uh, that loss would be $2 billion less. But if it introduced smart technologies, uh, on top of these two billion that the city would not have to spend on fixing the damage, it would gain four billion in terms of increased energy efficiency, flexibility, less brownouts in normal days. That would make the investment worth worthwhile. So, so resilience and sustainability and flexibility and efficiency go hand in hand. <laughs> So that's really interesting, but that's at the level of cities. So David, can you talk a bit at the individual level? You were talking about these people who died tragically in a tornado with plenty of warning. How can data help us as individuals make better decisions um, and, and deal with risk in a rational way? Do you see that happening at all? Well, but people have to be trained how to re either, A, those of us with data have to communicate it in a way. So our airline product, it's. It's, the model sends a pretty simple answer. Depart, delay, or cancel. <laughs> and so it's pretty clear you know what to do. Someone still makes a decision based on that, but mostly they do what that says. Um, people, citizens, need to believe in what they're being told um, and, and have it interpreted for them, or they have to be smart enough to interpret it themselves, which means they have to be educated. So I, I think there's a a lot of work with our, education is a whole different problem here, but I specifically think the data is advancing fast and the education is not advancing at all. And people have to be smart enough to interpret it. Or um, they have to have it simplified so they know what action to take. And I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. If we're always giving the action, then I think there's a lot of problems with civil liberty. But I think if people are going to make their own choices, they have to be smart enough to know how to use the data to make them. Absolutely. I think data should be empowering rather than dictatorial. I'd like to see that. So, so let, me, let me just add to that. I mean, it's, it's, it's also about uh, the Internet of Things in the future taking so much hassle away from us. So we won't even probably, we won't even realize anymore in our daily lives what, what the Internet of Things will do for us. Now, if we want to lead more efficient lives, if we want to be more resource uh, 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 viable, and so we, we, we still need to make a lot of conscious decisions, easy decisions like switching the light off when we leave a room, or maybe washing uh, our, our dishes during the night when energy is, is less expensive, and things like that. So all that, that lifestyle change or behavioral change that we need to make also in environmental terms, now is a conscious decision. In the future, all our devices and appliances will make those decisions for us, and it will make our lives so much easier for the individual, but it will also lead to increased levels of efficiency for the society as a whole. I hope we can eliminate cognitive drudgery. Like, we, we definitely need that. So can you eat, we've talked about a lot of benefits, we've talked about a couple of challenges. Can you share what you see to be the biggest challenges to getting to this future where we no longer have to worry about turning the lights on and off? Uh, what stands between us today and that future? Well, I, you know, I, I think Edward Snowden took us back <laughs> a long way. So when, um, when data is not trusted um, or the users of it are not trusted, then I think people have a hard time leaning into it. And so you mean that he made data a thing that is culturally uh, reviled and not something that we think of in the optimistic terms that we might have used a year or two ago? Yeah, well, I think you, yeah, it pointed out the risk. And I, you know, it's, there are two sides. There's an NSA side of the story and the Snowden side of the story, but the whole thing is a mess because um, unfortunately, um, data was exposed to be used in, in ways that people didn't trust. And I think people have to trust the data in order for the data to be useful to them. And the people who are using the data have to use it in trustworthy ways um, in order to earn that trust. So you know, to me, I think there is an issue of a new basis of trust um, that needs to be established so that the data is used for societal good and individual good. A otherwise, I think it's gonna, it's, it's gonna hit a wall. Data could solve a lot of problems today, but only if we all trust that it's solving problems we all want solved. Did you hear that? We all have to trust data. All right. Anything you want to add on challenges? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would definitely agree. Uh, it's we as human beings need to need to be ready for all that technology. We need to be ready to to accept it. Um, but also, the whole like regulatory and political environment probably will need to change. 
And if we look at, for instance, what's happening in the, um, in, in the mobility sector, I mean, the automobile of the future will be something quite fundamentally different from what we know today. It'll be, it'll be the electric car and it will steer itself. So it basically will be a driving computer with an electric drive in it. So what does that mean for, for, for markets, for businesses, for the automobile industry? complete paradigm change. What does it mean for the individual? Will we be ready to accept that? Will we deem those cars safe? Will we want to give up the, the as the German automobile industry tends to call it, the Freude am Fahren, the joy of driving? But also, what does it mean for the whole regulatory environment? If an accident happens, who is liable for it? What does it mean for insurance uh, policies and so on? So there's a huge kind of change that needs to happen on the individual level, on the societal level, on the regulatory level, level to get all those technologies uh, out there. Yeah. And I'm gonna, you, you have, we have to trust the data, but also the people who use the data have to be trustworthy. Um, so there's some combination of security for that, but also I think there's just a mat, a, a, an issue of morality and ethics on the data. So to me, I think being able to establish those standards and having people act in good ways is key. I think there's a lot of new um, ethics that need to be established. I would agree. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, so let's end on a positive note. If you close your eyes and imagine the world you're living in in five or ten years, what are you most excited about? Like, what are the big opportunities that you think are not getting enough attention today? Well, I, I you know, A, I hope we, we're doing a better job of educating the world's youth so that they can take advantage of the data, so the humans catch up. Um, and I, I believe there's demand, so I focus a lot on that. Um, but, but secondly, I think there is an enormous issue in that we're consuming uh, more energy, which is not good for the planet or people long term. And I truly believe the problem can be solved if smart systems are put in place to balance the load. Because um, a lot of it is we've got the energy produced in one place and consumed in another. So I think solving this issue of being really smart and energy efficient will ex make sure that humans and the planet last longer. So that's kind of my goal for the next five years. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I mean, uh, uh, better, uh, better using uh, in a more resourceful way our energy will be a key challenge of, a, of the future where we will have nine billion people on the planet uh, uh, that will all live on, 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 on increased wealth levels and consuming more, more energy. We can only cope if we make a, quant a quantum leap in terms of uh, uh, efficiency, both of energy generation, distribution, and in the ways how we use energy and smart technology can, can help us. And they will, all, they will help us also overcome a lot of inertia you know, that is there. We all know the challenge is there. Do we really react to it? It's a challenge that's far out there in the far future, all these challenges of, of the consequences of climate change and, 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 and f uh, finite resources and so. Uh, it doesn't really make us lead different lives, but technology will support us to that and that's the great opportunity out there. All right, so I'd like to thank you both, uh, Stefan and David, and thanks to everyone. Uh, yeah. Thank you.